want to welcome you to the ministry center. So glad that you're here. We had such a great time this morning in the 9 o'clock service. I think we had about 180 people in this house this morning that's already worshipped. Now, can we give the Lord thanks for that? What a great crowd here uh, for the second service, even though you had to take a boat to get here with all this rain. So thank you for your faithfulness of coming to the house of the Lord this morning. And I stand before you today excited about what I believe the Lord's going to do in this next season of our church. I remember my first Sunday here when I came and tried out for you. I believe if my memory serves me right, there's 82 people in the house that morning. And I told my wife after church, and I think I later told you all when I came to be the pastor, I said, I get excited because every empty seat in that room, I believe, is a soul that God wants to use this church to bring to Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we go to two services, as we make room, I have that excitement again. For a long time, I couldn't say that because there wasn't no empty seats. Amen. But by going to two services, by making more room, I believe every empty seat you see in this room at 11 o'clock service is a soul that Jesus wants to save yes. and to help. And to that end, I want to preach to you this morning a, a word the Lord has so lodged in my heart from Mark chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1, read through verse 5, and then we'll skip down to verses 11 and 12. And look at what the Lord says to us. It says, when Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer space, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And some people came, bringing to him a man who was paralyzed or crippled, carried by four men. When they were unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after digging an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralyzed man was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 11, I say to you, get up. Pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I want us to pray together today as I want to share with you this thought, carrying the crippled. Let's pray together. Father, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. God, as we gather in this house, as we march together into a new season of our church, God, I pray, captivate our hearts today. Minister, O oh Lord, and speak to us. God, we need to hear from heaven this morning. Yes. Nothing I say will do, but you, O oh God, have a word and a task for your people. Help us to hear it and be changed by it today, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. He was crippled. The only two details the Bible gives us regarding this man is that he was a sinner and he was paralyzed. He was crippled both spiritually and also physically. We know that this man was a sinner, for Jesus will later forgive his sins. He had made choices that were unwise, and he was now reaping the consequences of those decisions. This man needed a fresh start. This man needed to be transformed. This man needed a new lease on life. And fortunately, he heard about a man named Jesus that could forgive any sin, that could erase every bit of guilt, that could change any life. And that Jesus had come to Capernaum. He was at the house. And yet, herein lies the second problem. This man was not only crippled spiritually, he was also crippled physically. We don't know what happened to this man, how long he'd been in this condition, but he could not get where Jesus was. Instead, he was confined to a mat, or he was confined to a pallet, here's what they call it, and he could not get up and go where Jesus was. Catch it now. Something in his life physically, naturally, that's keeping him from the Jesus that could heal him spiritually. And this morning, I would suggest 
that we all know someone like this crippled man. We all know someone who's crippled spiritually, that along the line of life, they have made choices that were unwise. And now the consequences of those choices are crippling them. They decided to try drugs, and yet now they are addicted. It controls their life, and it's crippling them. They left their spouse and kids to go and see if the grass was greener on the other side, yet now their family is dysfunctional, and it's crippling them. They decided they wanted to do something besides God and go and try the world and see if it could give them the joy they were looking for. They chased money and they chased possessions, yet now their life is devoid of meaning and it is crippling them. We all know people who have been crippled by the choices that they've made. For some of you, it's a classmate you're about to see at school again. For some of you, it's a co-worker. For some of you, it's a family member. For some of you, it may even be you in this house today, crippled by the choices that you've made in life. Yet, friend, today I bring you good gospel news. Jesus is in the house this morning. Amen. Jesus is here to pick up paralyzed people. Jesus is here to deliver addicted people. Jesus is here to put families back together. Jesus is here to give you a reason to live again. Jesus is here to give help to the helpless. Jesus is here to give hope to the hopeless. Jesus is here to give rest to the weary. Jesus is here to meet your every need. Oh, I've got good news today. Jesus is in the house this morning. Hallelujah. Yeah, herein lies the second problem. Just as this lame man had things in his life physically, naturally, that were keeping him away from Jesus. So I've learned that people who are crippled spiritually also have things that are keeping them physically away from Jesus. Maybe... In their life, they just never grew up in church and don't know anything about God, and now it's keeping them from Jesus. Maybe they used to be in church, but they got hurt and said they'd never have anything to do with God again, and now they can't get to Jesus. Maybe they've never had anyone invite them to church. Maybe they've never had anybody offer to pick them up. Maybe they've never had anyone share their testimony with them, and now they don't know how to get to Jesus. You see, friend, this morning I've come to understand that people that don't come to church, people that don't come to the house where Jesus is, there are often reasons they do not come. There are things keeping them from Jesus. But thanks be to God, this man, he could not get to Jesus on his own, but he had four friends that knew how to get him to Jesus. They gathered around him and they lifted him up and they began to carry his bed to where Jesus was. They had faith that if they could get their friend to Jesus, that Jesus would make him whole. Hallelujah. Yes. Yet, I hope today that those people that are crippled in your life, I hope today those people in your life that need Jesus, I hope that they are not on their own. I hope today there's some people in this room that are willing to rise up and say, you know what, I think I can pick some people up and bring them to Jesus. I think I can make a difference in the lives of people around me. Now, here's the catch. They bring their friend to Jesus. And when they get there, I don't know how long they carried him. I don't know how far the distance was. I know this, they were tired when they got there. Amen. Hey, you know that, preacher, because I can pick up a piece of furniture and carry it to that back door, and I'll be winded when I get there. Somebody say amen. That's right. Let me know I'm not alone in that. <laughs> they dragged their buddy to Jesus, but when they get there, they find out they weren't the only ones that had faith because there was a whole crowd of people that were already there. They had filled the house to overflowing to the point there was not room for one person, the Bible says, much less four people carrying a man on a mat. You see, these people that were filling the house, 
Undoubtedly, they had faith in Jesus. If they did not have faith in Jesus, they would not have been there. And so in this moment, we find two kinds of people with faith. Two kinds of Christians, if you will. Those that crowd the Christ and those that carry the crippled. And we're going to talk about both of those this morning because I've come to understand that even in church today, there are two kinds of people. There are two kinds of Christians. There are those that crowd the Christ and there are those that carry the crippled. So those that crowd the Christ, they were willing to fill the house where Jesus was, but they weren't worried about people who weren't in the house where Jesus was. They had faith in Jesus, but they weren't worried about people who were outside the house that did not yet know Jesus. You see, today I'm worried that there are many people like this in church. They want to crowd the Christ, but they don't want to carry the crippled. They'll come to church and worship God, but they won't invite anybody to church on Monday. They'll come and give and pay their tithes, but they won't give the time to uh, tell someone what God has done in their life. That they'll come and they'll sing songs unto the Lord, but they won't offer to pick somebody up and bring them to church on Sunday. Amen. They, they love the Lord and they're willing to crowd to Christ, but they aren't willing to lift up crippled people and bring them to Jesus. Catch it now, because they're so busy doing church, they've forgotten how to be the church. They're so busy crowding Jesus that they forgot that Jesus has called them to reach out to a broken world and lift them up and bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. We can get so busy crowding Jesus that we forget about a broken world. But thanks be to God, there aren't just people in this story that crowd the Christ. There are also people that carry the crippled. Those four men, they were tired, they were wore out. Yet they looked and they saw a staircase going up on the roof. That was normal in those days. And they said to themselves, we know what we have to do. They lifted up their friend, and they hauled him up those stairs up onto the roof. In the ancient world, a roof was made of concrete slabs put together, and then they would take dirt and grass, and they would pack it on top of it. And so the Bible says they uncovered the roof, meaning they started raking back that dirt with their hands. And then it says they broke up the roof, meaning they had to break open those tiles to open a hole big enough to let their buddy down. Now, here's the kicker. There was no insurance in the ancient world. If you got a wild hair to tear up your buddy's roof, guess who had to put that roof back? You did. You did. So now, not only have they drugged their friend all the way to Jesus, not only have they had to get sweaty up on the roof, not only have they had to get dirty tearing that dirt back, now they're going to have to pay to have this thing put back on. How easy it would have been for them to have started counting the cost and said, let's just leave the crippled guy by the door. We've done our part. How easy it would have been to have started counting the cost and say, I want to get the man to Jesus, but they didn't tell me this was going to take all day. I ain't got time for this. How easy it would have been to have said, oh, we want to get him to Jesus. But nobody told me I was going to have to get dirty. I, I wore my church clothes. I came to see Jesus. I can't get up there in the dirt. Come on. Come on. How easy it would have been to start counting the cost and to make a decision not to carry the crippled. Yet I love these men because they came with their mind made up. They said, listen, I don't care how long it takes. We're going to get him to Jesus. I don't care how dirty I get. I'm going to get him to Jesus. I don't care how sweaty I may get. I'll get him to Jesus. I don't care how much money it costs me. I'm going to get him to Jesus. No matter the cost, we're going to bring crippled people to Jesus so that Jesus can make them a whole. Hallelujah. And I come to you this morning with a heavy heart because I have seen along the years so many churches that began to carry crippled people, but along the way they got so busy counting the cost that they missed out on being used by Jesus. 
In the church today, we're good at counting the costs. We're willing to carry the crippled as long as it does not cost us our time. I saw a church years ago. They wanted to reach the community. They decided to buy a van to go pick kids up. Church voted that Sunday. 100% of the people wanted a van ministry, so they went and bought a new van. And yet when they got the van, they found out that even though 100% of the church wanted a van ministry, not one of them had time to drive the thing. So rather than going to pick up kids, they sold the van and redid the landscaping instead. Come on. We're good at counting the cost. We would carry the crippled as long as it does not cost us too much money. I saw a church several years ago. God started blessing. They started growing. God began to do things. And all of a sudden, the finance committee lost their mind. They came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you would not believe the amount of money we're spending on food, the amount of money we're spending on Sunday school literature. They even said this, Pastor, you wouldn't believe how much we're spending on toilet paper. It has to stop. Come on. Oh, we're good at counting the cost. We will carry the crippled as long as it does not cost us our familiarity of what we're comfortable with. I saw a church several years ago. They prayed for revival. God sent it. People started getting saved left and right. And eventually that little country church grew. They got to over 150 people. And some of the leaders came to the pastor. And they said, Pastor, we asked God to grow this church and we meant it. But we only want God to grow it to about 150 people. Because once you get over 150 people, you can't know everybody by their first name. And that's what we're comfortable with. Friend, I assure you, had their child, had their grandchild been 151, that number would not matter. We're good at counting the cost. We're willing to carry the crippled as long as it doesn't cost us our spot. I saw a church several years ago. God sent revival. People started getting saved. And that was all great until those people got saved actually started doing something. They started door greeting. They started playing instruments. They started getting involved. And people come to the pastor and say, Pastor, we can't have this. You can't let them sing. I'm the one that sings. You can't let them greet at the door. I'm the one. You can't let them sit there. That's where I sit. You can't let them park there. That's where I park. Come on. That's right. Come on, brother. So many churches will start carrying the crippled until it starts costing them something. And then they make up their mind that they're not willing to pay the price. But Ministry Center, I've come to you this morning with a clarion call from God that God is calling us to rip off the roof. God is calling us to say no matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, no matter what it requires, no matter what we give up, we need to bring a crippled world to Jesus that they might know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Friend, now is not the time to count the cost. Now is the time to carry crippled people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would somebody give him praise one more time in this house today? Because notice what happens when they stop counting the cost and they carry the crippled to God. They open up the hole. They lower the man down. And as they lower him down, Jesus sees their faith and he says, you are forgiven. Rise. Take up your mat and walk. And in that moment, every sin he had ever committed was forgiven. Every bit of guilt in his life was released. And wouldn't you know it, not only that, all of a sudden those legs that weren't working, he got up on his feet, rolled up his mat and walked out the door he couldn't get in just a minute ago because Jesus changed his life and he would never be the same again. Hallelujah. I tell you, church, this is what I believe God wants to do at the ministry center. In the weeks to come, in the months to come, we're going to see some people take up their mat and leave. We're going to see people come crippled, and they're going to leave whole. They're going to come with some things that are keeping them far from God. But Jesus is going to touch them, and Jesus is going to forgive them, and Jesus is going to make them whole. And we're going to see people walk out these doors with a mat under their arm because they aren't who they used to be anymore. God changed their life. Say, preacher, what does it take for that to happen? Well, look what it took here. I want you to notice, before the healing, before the forgiveness, before revival broke out, here's what it says. 
Jesus saw their faith. It's all predicated on that sentence. Jesus saw their faith. Two things I need you to notice there. Now I'll be done. Jesus saw their faith. It wasn't enough for him to hear about it. It wasn't enough for them to stand on the ceiling and talk about it. They had to put it in action and do whatever it took to get the man to Jesus. Why do you say that, preacher? Because I talked to a church not long ago. They told me, they said, we put together an outreach committee that's planning and discussing how we're going to reach our community. I said, how long ago was that? They said, a year and a half. I said, how many people have you reached? They said, no, nobody. We're still talking about it. I'm all for a good plan. I'm all for doing things with excellence. But at some point, church, we got to stop talking about it and just roll up our sleeves and do it. Get our hands in the dirt and start breaking up the tiles and say it's time not to say it, but to rise up and do it. Because catch the second thing you got to see here. Jesus saw their faith. Not his faith, the man, he's a crippled sinner. Their faith, the four men. He saw them rip off the roof. He saw them get dirty. He saw them get sweaty. He saw them put in the time. He saw them lower it down. And when he saw their faith, then he looked at the man and healing and deliverance came to him because of their faith. So here's the point. Jesus is in the house. He's here. To roll up mats. He's here to put lives together. He's here to fix the broken people in your life. What's he waiting on? He's waiting to see your faith. He's waiting to see us tear off some roofs. He's waiting on us to stop counting the cost and roll up our sleeves and do it. He's waiting on us to say, God, whatever it takes to bring a broken world to you, we're willing to go. And if we'll show God our faith, Jesus will do His work in His house. And lives will be changed, but it begins with us. Let's carry the cripple together. Would you stand with me this morning?